President Richard Milhouse Nixon, aka Tricky Dick, is infuriated as he hiccups his way through his office, stumbling over the lip of a rug with a freshly opened bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild in his hand. He pours himself a glass and gets on the phone with his Joint Chiefs of Staff. As soon as he gets through, he growls, We gotta nuke em. Bomb the bleep out of em. And this, dear viewers, is not some fiction the infographic show has created. We might not know the exact words Nixon used, but he definitely did order a nuclear strike against North Korea when he was wasted. In fact, you'd be surprised how often Nixon called around, saying there was no time to spare. A nuclear strike was necessary. As Henry Kissinger, Nixon's national security advisor, once said about him, if the president had his way, there would be a nuclear war each week. Before we get to Nixon almost unleashing hell on our Korean brothers, we think we should explain to you some things about the US of A, its enemies, and how close they were to being nuked. As you know, talk of nuclear weapons is all the rage again. In the fall of 2022, US media was saying that President Joe Biden's national security advisor had just warned Russia that if it used nuclear weapons, there would be catastrophic consequences. It's not the kind of thing you want to hear while you're eating your cornflakes in the morning. Anyone alive for a few decades probably thought, oh god, not this again. Before we go on, we should clarify something that might have been troubling some of you. You've likely heard people talking about tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. There's a difference, although that exact definition is not always, well, exact. In short, a tactical nuke is smaller and likely would be used for short-range attacks, mainly aimed at locations with tactical value rather than cities. They have less of an explosive yield, perhaps anywhere from 1 kiloton to 50 kilotons, but 50 kilotons is hardly a firecracker, given that the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. A strategic nuclear weapon might yield 100 kilotons to over a megaton of TNT. The USA's B-83 has a yield of 1.2 megatons. Russia's Tsar Bomba, which was tested in 1961, was said to have a yield of around 50 megatons. So not all nukes do the same damage, but when you consider that altogether nuclear states have about 13,000 nuclear warheads, you can see why most rational people are scared of escalation between atomic nations. Russia and the US have the vast majority of such weapons, including tactical and strategic. The other nuclear states are the UK, France, Pakistan, China, India, Israel, and North Korea, each with various types of atomic weaponry. As many people have said regarding the Ukraine war, a tactical strike could lead to a strategic strike, and then we might as well kiss goodbye to life as we know it. Experts say that one tactical strike could indeed lead to large-scale retaliatory nuclear attacks. Still, most of you are likely thinking, well, it would never come to that. Our leaders of the free-ish world and those leaders of the unfree world are not that mad. Surely, you think, they'd tell you first. They wouldn't escalate or even launch a tactical strike, you'd imagine, because they know how quickly that would become a full-on nuclear war. Well, we hate to tell you this, but some people have what you might call a trigger finger. Nixon was one of them, and we reckon you'll agree with us by the end of the show. As you know, the Americans were the first to test a nuclear weapon. During World War II, British scientists teamed up with US scientists along with some other big brain scientists from Europe and they worked on the Manhattan Project. At that same time, the Soviets were trying to make the bomb but they were way behind. Stalin liked to murder his best scientists, and Germany, despite having brilliant physicists, was not even close. The Allies didn't know that though. On July 16, 1945, President Harry Truman received the message, babies satisfactorily born. That meant the first nuclear test had been successful. The next day, Truman, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin started their lengthy talks at the Potsdam Conference. At one point, Truman walked up behind Stalin as Stalin was sitting down, and he whispered in his ear about the news from the US's new weapon of unusual destructive force. Stalin's expression didn't change, but inside he was seething. His Minister of Internal Affairs, Sergei Kruglov, later said at that moment Stalin realized his dream of a socialist revolution all over Europe was likely over. The US and the rest of the Western capitalists had the upper hand, for now. In short, the US later understood that it could use its new power to make other countries do as they were told. The US could employ nuclear blackmail, which went something like, if you don't get the hell out of Dodge, we'll bomb the crap out of you. Those countries knew exactly what that meant because they'd seen what had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The thing is, nuclear blackmail only really works when you have more firepower than the nation you're blackmailing. It's not ideal when the outcome could be mutually assured destruction. Having seen what those weapons could do, Truman was not keen on having his name connected to more streets full of wrecked houses and dead men, women, and children. But in 1950, he considered using those bombs again. This time, the enemy was China, which was fighting the US in the Korean War. It should be noted that the Soviets had tested a nuclear weapon in 1949, 
but an airdrop would not be undertaken until 1951. The idea was a bunch of nukes could hit various places in China, and the Korean War, which was proving to be a very difficult and deadly war for the Americans, could come to a conclusion very quickly. General Douglas MacArthur later admitted that he had the plan to launch 30 to 50 tactical atomic bombs that he said would mean an end to war in less than 10 days. Truman disagreed and famously fired MacArthur as a result. MacArthur blamed Truman for not ending the war quickly. He said Truman was needlessly sacrificing American lives. We know from documents that were declassified many years later that Truman and the others believed attacking China could lead to mayhem in Asia. If Russia got involved, things would get really bad. On top of that, those documents revealed that America's military strength wasn't exactly what MacArthur and many American citizens believed it was. An attack on China, they concluded, would be extreme and utterly reckless. Just bear in mind that many powerful Americans did not think the same. In 1954, when the French were struggling in Vietnam, the US said it would help under what it called Operation Vulture. The plan was to send B-29s over and drop a load of tactical nukes on the Vietnamese, thereby smashing their army. Still, what if China got involved? Vice President Richard Nixon and the Secretary of State John Foster Dulles were totally up for nuking the Vietnamese, but President Dwight D. Eisenhower wasn't so sure about it. He, like Truman, had not felt great about what happened in Japan. Still, his generals didn't seem to concern themselves too much regarding mass murder scruples. Eisenhower once told them in a meeting, You boys must be crazy. We can't use those awful things against Asians for a second time in less than 10 years? My God! They were deadly serious. Eisenhower later agreed to Operation Vulture but said it could only happen in two conditions. First, the operation must pass Congress, and second, the Brits must be on board. Eisenhower explained, Without allies and associates, the leader is just an adventurer like Genghis Khan. The US nuking everyone he knew wasn't a good look. He didn't want the Americans to do this alone, so if it happened at all, it had to be an Anglo-American attack. In the end, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill said no way was Britain getting involved. So that was that. And anyway, Eisenhower eventually became convinced nuking Vietnam was a bad idea. In 1955, yet again, the US considered a nuclear strike. This time, the reason was China seizing the islands in the Taiwan Strait during what was called the First Taiwan Strait Crisis. At first, Eisenhower said he was on board with the plan, famously saying that nukes should be used just like a bullet from a gun. Vice President Nixon, yet to be known for all his trickiness, but already fond of very expensive French wine, was of course up for using them as he always was. At the time, he said tactical atomic weapons are now conventional and will be used against the targets of any aggressive force. Later in life, Eisenhower made a famous speech about what he called the American military-industrial complex. This was not the kind of thing Nixon would have ever said. Eisenhower talked about how the industry could get out of hand. After all, he'd been surrounded by hawks during his time in power. One of them was Mr. Nixon, who was about to get even more hawkish. Eisenhower, former military leader and hero of World War II, kinda shocked people with that speech. We should also say that Eisenhower increased spending on nuclear weapons. Still, he saw what was happening in the arms race and warned Americans about a disastrous rise of misplaced power that might not always act in the interest of ordinary Americans. But he also knew the US needed to protect itself. If you want peace, prepare for war is the term that springs to mind. Nixon might have said, there's no such thing as peace, just go to war. Okay, so now you know a few things. One, you know that the US was on a few occasions very close to using nukes. Two, you know the world in those days was a pretty unstable place. There were conflicts everywhere, proxy wars, and the main conflict was between the communist Soviet Union and the US with Great Britain on its side. China was, of course, on the side of the Soviets. Remember at this point that Britain had been considerably weakened after World War II and the US had risen like a magnificent phoenix that at times maybe flew a bit too close to the sun. At least Stalin was dead. Now Nikita Khrushchev, who'd established himself as the leader in 1955, said he wanted peaceful coexistence with the US. It's hard to know what Nixon wanted, but as you've already seen, he was hardly a pacifist. In 1969, just as the hippies were preaching love and peace, their nemesis Nixon came to power. And what an awkward juxtaposition that was. Nixon was about to unleash hell, but a hell that most Americans would know nothing about. For instance, many years later, a Secret Service agent said he was with Nixon and some of his staff one day, and they were talking about what to do with Cambodia. The former agent said Nixon was drunk, as he often was. He added, they were half in the tank, sitting around the pool, drinking, and Nixon got on the phone and said, Mom the bleep out of them. Cambodia did get bombed. It got bombed a lot, which was kept a secret as it went against international law. Some experts say about 500,000 Cambodians died in the campaign, called Operation Freedom Deal. 
About 2 million people were displaced from their homes, and for decades, kids lost limbs when they stepped on unexploded bombs. Nixon's drunken wish also helped the tyrant Pol Pot come to power, which led to one of the worst genocides in human history. We might learn from this that a drunken man sitting in a pool can say a few words that lead to a crisis of unimaginable proportions for millions of people on the other side of the world. We're not saying Operation Freedom Deal only went ahead because of what Nixon said right then in the pool. Of course, that didn't happen, but he sometimes gave very serious orders when he was wasted. After Cambodia, his next victim was supposed to be North Korea. One country absolutely on the side of the Soviets was North Korea, the so-called Hermit Kingdom. There was nothing the US could do to get it on its side. There were no tyrants to install who would say nice things about capitalism as they tortured their people. North Korea was untouchable in this respect, and the US disliked that, even though North Korea was far from being able to make nuclear weapons. For Nixon, this black sheep secretive state needed to go. Nixon had already professed to many people that he was good with the idea of nuking Vietnam. When he came to power, a man named David Young, the administrative assistant to Henry Kissinger, heard Nixon and Kissinger talking. Nixon was drunk again. Young later said he heard Nixon say, Henry, we gotta nuke him. Such threats were not the idle kind. You already know what happened in Cambodia. Then in 1969, Nixon was informed that some North Korean fighter jets had just shot down an unarmed American spy plane. This was an American EC-121 reconnaissance plane, and on board was a full crew. The plane was flying over international waters near Japan when it was hit. The US never expected this. The plane had performed such operations before without a problem. Of course, North Korea didn't much like the idea of American planes gathering intelligence on them, so they blasted it out of the sky and all 31 crew died. Understandably, Nixon was absolutely infuriated when he heard this, but again, he'd been drinking, so his emotions got the better of him. What happened next remained a secret to Americans for decades. That day, a guy named Bruce Charles was on duty at Kunsan Air Base in South Korea. His job was to wait for an alert regarding what was called the Single Integrated Operational Plan. This meant basically waiting around to get a message that told him to get on a plane and attack a target. That day, he received the order to prepare for a strike on North Korea. The plane he was to use for the strike was an F-4 carrying a B-61 nuclear bomb. This yielded about 330 kilotons of TNT, 20 times bigger than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. This order Charles knew was serious business. Many people would die if he went through with it, but as the attack was going to be on an airfield, not a city, it would have been no Hiroshima. Charles waited and waited until a few hours later he was told to stand down. He later said in an interview, the order to stand down was just about dusk. It was not a certainty. The colonel said, looks like from the messages I'm getting we'll not do this today. I don't know about tomorrow. Two days later, Nixon was speaking at a press conference, saying how he believed that even though the loss of the crew was a terrible tragedy, US retaliation could lead to something very ugly, and that, said Nixon, could not happen on his watch. His administration was all about finding peace in Asia. He said, A number of developments have convinced me that the chances for bringing this war to a peaceful conclusion have significantly improved. Some of the press were surprised, as was the public. They heaped praise on Nixon for being so level-headed and, for once, showing restraint where it was due. As usual, they only knew half the story. Well, about a fifth of it. At the time of his order, Nixon, blasted on booze, had shown no restraint at all. He got on the phone with his Joint Chiefs and said, scramble the jets right now. He ordered an imminent nuclear strike. He clearly had had enough, and North Korea had now provided him with a good reason to use the nukes. It all sounded like satire, but it isn't a joke. It's the truth. There are documents to prove it, which were released in 2010 under a Freedom of Information request. The documents talked about Operation Freedom Drop, which consisted of pre-coordinated options for the selective use of tactical nuclear weapons against North Korea. Nixon was so drunk he fell asleep, and while he was out cold, Kissinger got on the phone with the Joint Chiefs and told them not to do a thing. North Korea could wait. The reports state that the Joint Chiefs agreed to not do anything until Nixon sobered up in the morning. Seems Nixon wasn't in the mood for mass murder when he awoke later, and possibly thousands of North Korean lives were spared that day. Not to mention the escalation of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. As Kissinger said, if Nixon had had his way, life on planet Earth could have been severely disrupted. Nonetheless, Christopher Hitchens, who was usually a very reliable critic, said Kissinger should be prosecuted for war crimes, for crimes against humanity, and for offenses against common or customary or international law, including conspiracy to commit murder, kidnap, and torture. We guess that made Nixon just one hawk of many on that rugged hill of politics. Now you really need to watch what if North Korea launched a nuclear bomb minute by minute, or have a look at what if Russia launched a nuclear bomb minute by minute.